Hello, uh, my name is Wendy. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, uh, and I'm um, part of the Anaconda team, uh, and I've been the lead developer of the Anaconda backend. Uh, so welcome to my presentation about the story of the Anaconda backend. Let's start with a simple question, what is Anaconda? Uh, Anaconda is a system installer used by uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, used, used by uh, Fedora, RHEL, and other operating systems based, based on this. Um, and uh, it kind of is doing three stuff. So usually when you want to install something uh, on your system, uh, you download an ISO, uh, put it on your USB uh, stick, uh, boot it, uh, and then what happens is that Anaconda configures uh, the runtime configuration, uh, so it modifies the installation environment based on uh, some preferences and detected, detected values. Uh, then uh, it tries to collect the user preferences about the final system, so you can select what kind of language uh, would you like to see on your system. Uh, the time zone, you can choose some specific software you want to install, uh, define the partitioning and create some user accounts. And uh, then we verify that this is uh, valid and it looks like the new system should be viable and bootable and usable. Uh, and after that, we allow to start the system installation. And this is important because where we, while we collect the user preferences, we don't really touch any of your disks uh, and we don't modify your data. Uh, but once you confirm that you want to start installation, that's where uh, all the magic happens and we uh, use your user preferences to do some real actions on your hardware. Uh, so quickly, how does it look? So the runtime configuration uh, usually happens in the very early stages. You usually don't even see the screen because it happens very quickly. Uh, then eventually you end up on something like this where you can specify what you want to do. Uh, as I said, nothing really happens. We just collect your data. Uh, and when we have all that we need, we enable the begin installation button. Uh, and then uh, we actually do the real action. Uh, why I'm mentioning this? Uh, Anaconda is very difficult because of this part, like the part where we just collect stuff, uh, but we cannot really actually do some stuff uh, because we have to kind of uh, simulate what's going to happen and how the system is going to look like, and that's not easy. Uh, and also you can like visit uh, and configure anything in a very random way. So you can start with the user account and then specify the software and then specify the partitioning, but in a reality what happens next is that we start with the storage, download the software, and then we start to create some configuration. Uh, so yeah, this is the difficult part. Uh, so, what's the actual Anaconda uh, modernization? Uh, so, this is the initiative that started in 2017, uh, and the idea was pretty simple. Uh, so, we started with something like this, and that was one huge monolithic Python application that had everything in one process. So, the user interface had access to all the data that you might need or you might not need. Uh, everything could use anything, and it was all very interconnected, and it was just a huge mess. Uh, so the idea was to separate this uh, that data and business logic into uh, DBus services, uh, and have the user interface and the DBus services, and the DBus services can talk to each other, and user interface can talk to DBus services. Uh, what will you gain with this is that uh, eventually, you can replace the user interface with something that's not even based on Python, and for example, have the web-based uh, UI, which you might have heard about <laughs> this year. Um, so yeah, the idea of the web, uh, web UI is very old, actually, and it started here in this year, uh, because it was the ultimate goal to get there. Uh, so that was the plan. What was the reality? So. <laughs> This is kind of what you have. Like, Anaconda is a very old project, <laughs> and it's not pretty. <laughs> so there are like no nice boxes that you could just take and move to some service. You have to create these nice boxes first. So you just start somewhere. Uh, so let's say you are able to identify a piece of code that looks kind of isolated, and maybe you might be able to move it on the bus. Uh, so the next thing you have to check is what kind of data does it use. And if there is anything that's not really on the bus yet, you cannot really touch this logic because you would miss the data. So instead of that, you target the data, uh, 
see where it's used and migrate the data first. Make sure that all the code that uses this data are using the Dbus API to uh, gather them and change them. And then you actually can go back to the piece of code that you wanted to move and move it. Uh, so based on that, uh, we targeted the data. So Anaconda had a lot of weird data objects for some reason. Uh, so yeah, we had a lot of global variables that was lovely, but we eventually got rid of them. Uh, another weird object was the Kickstarter data. Um, so Anaconda has like this special mode when you can like automatically run the installation using a Kickstarter file. And Kickstarter data is like a Python representation of this um, Kickstarter file. But the Kickstarter data are used also for interactive installation because we use it as a main data holder of your preferences which doesn't make sense because Kickstarter doesn't support everything that Anaconda does, so you end up with a lot of workarounds and that causes a lot of issues. Uh, another funny object that we have is the storage model. Uh, so as I said, uh, the storage model is, uh, yeah, uh, so, so we, we have to som somehow like simulate the actions first. So with the storage model, we have a Python representation of your device tree. Uh, and we do actions on this device tree and we just check the result and when we are happy we actually apply these changes to your real storage. Uh, but unfortunately our storage model didn't have an undo button but sometimes you had to like re reset because you ended up with a very invalid model. Um, but this object was already propagated to all corners of the UI so you couldn't, couldn't just throw it away and create a new one. Um, you had to somehow reset it. And that was also an issue that we solved later uh, in the modernization. Uh, then we had a representation of the payload object. Uh, by payload, we call like all the support that we need for installation software on your system. Uh, and then there is a special category of product data where every product can have a little different um, defaults that they want to sh show users. Uh, so that's also something that we need to uh, take in account. Uh, so the most problematic part was the uh, Kickstarter data actually. So we decided to uh, start the planning around that and we collected all the Kickstart comments uh, that are supported by Anaconda and we split them to some areas that made sense and th this is basically the foundation of the Dbus modules and you finally have something to work on. It has very clear goals and you just go um, module by module, command by command, and just try to figure out how to like, handle this command via the Dbus module. So this was the plan. The phase one uh, targeted the system installation, so everything that you needed to actually uh, finish the installation. Uh, and the phase one was actually finished uh, on, um, uh, on April, uh, so yay, we are done with this one. Uh, the second phase <laughs> uh, is going to target the runtime configuration. Uh, it's about the uh, runtime module and the boss module. Uh, the boss module is kind of uh, special because its main purpose is to orchest orchestrate other modules and send them some data and collect some data from them and basically it like oversees uh, the whole Dbus API. Uh, so what kind of challenges did we face? Uh, so the first question was where will we develop this code? And we had two options. The first one was to have a development branch, which would be separate from the production branch. And it would be nice because if we make a mistake, it will not affect any critical workflows like Fedora Rawhide. Uh, unfortunately, it means that uh, until you release uh, this thing, you don't get any feedback about what you are doing. So you don't really know if your uh, idea of how it should work really works in the real world. Uh, another thing that we were afraid of was to keep it in sync with the production branch because this, this project didn't have a very high priority and there was always like new stuff and features and requests that were coming up and we still continued development of the production branch. And we didn't want to lose these features and bug fixes, <laughs> so we would have to uh, port everything to the development branch. And we knew that that would be just too much work. Uh, so the other option was to use the production branch. And that has a lot of benefits, but unfortunately, you can very easily break Federal height, and you don't want to do that. Um, yeah, so there was like a lot of pressure. <laughs> 
uh, about making it right, and we were doing very thorough um, request reviews, and yeah, we spent most of the time on just making sure that we didn't forget any, any use cases before we actually did some change, and that was very difficult to do, but I think, like, considering the amount of work that we did, we didn't mess up so much. <laughs> um, yeah, so what we had and have for all these years was kind of a hybrid solution. Because, I mean, some of the Kickstarter commands were migrated on the Dbus modules, but a lot of them were still uh, handled by the user interface. And that created a lot of interesting situations um, and challenges, because you somehow needed to take this Kickstart file, tear it to pieces, send it to the right components, collect the feedback about possible issues and validation errors, um, and later again uh, collect new pieces of this Kickstart file and generate an output Kickstart file. Um, another thing that we had to make sure is that there is no overlap, that we didn't forget uh, to remove the management of one kickstart command from the user interface but while it's already handled by another Dbus module. So we uh, wrote a lot of unit tests for that to make sure that uh, this is fine. Um, yeah, another challenge that we had uh, was how to quickly and safely develop the Dbus API. Uh, I don't know if you ever read the Dbus specification, don't, you will. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very difficult to like understand and grasp. Um, so we, we needed to make sure that, that what we are writing is right and that we don't have to spend a lot of time on, on uh, like these, these little tweaks and weirdness of the Dbus uh, API and that we can focus on the code. Uh, and we knew that uh, we will develop this very like in iterative way and that's going to be a lot of refactorization of the Dbus API. And for example, one of the things that you need to provide at some point is like XML specification of your Dbus object. And that's really not something that you want to refactorize because it would work. <laughs> Uh, so what we actually did, uh, we started with the PyDebus library, but we built a lot of functionality around that that would simplify a lot of stuff for us. And eventually we threw away the PyDebus library and created a new one, which solved some other issues that we had with testing, for example, uh, and put there all the new support that we created. And now it's available uh, on PIP and other operating systems, uh, so you can use it if you want to. Uh, so, another issue that we had uh, was the management of uh, the default values. Uh, so, the problem with defaults is that we have a lot of sources of the default values. I mean, like, Anaconda has some ideas what are the defaults, but then the products have some, like, other ideas what the default should be. And then you have, like, these kernel arguments and boot options that can override them. Uh, and we didn't want to, like, um, propagate all these sources to the Dbus modules so they can, like, pick one. Um, so instead of that, we introduced the Anaconda configuration files that are just text-based, uh, and we, in very early stages, uh, process all the sources at, at some point, generate a temporary uh, runtime configuration file, and then we start the Dbus modules. And the first thing that the Dbus module is doing is that it's looking for this new uh, runtime configuration, and it's using only this one, so it doesn't have to care about the other sources, which helped us a lot. Um, so, uh, and the final question was, how can we test the thing? Uh, so, uh, the main goal was to be able to test the backend with unit tests very easily, and unfortunately, and luckily, <laughs> uh, we were able to do that with the libraries that we had. Uh, so, we didn't have to, like, do any weirdness with Dbus demands, and we didn't have to, like, test really the Dbus API, we could just, uh, create these uh, Python representations of the Dbus API and uh, unit test them directly, which simplified a lot of things. Uh, what we also were focusing on was the end-to-end -end testing. And with Anaconda, Anaconda is very difficult to test, so this was like the best effort we could do, and that was the focus on Kickstarter tests. Uh, but that was actually good because we were targeting Kickstarter commands. So it makes sense when we uh, was migrating a Kickstarter command like auto part and it wasn't covered by these end-to-end -end tests, we could write a new end-to-end -end test to make sure that it's covered forever. Uh, so we spent a lot of time on this and improved into infrastructure a lot and it was also great. Uh, so uh, what's the 
current situation. Uh, so as I said, we finished the first phase, and this is the co-distribution of our current modules. As you can see, storage kind of consumes like most of that code. Uh, then it's payload network, and the other modules are pretty small. So you can guess that we spent years on the storage development and uh, another years on the payloads module <coughs> uh, and then the network. And the other stuff was pretty much easy. Uh, so here are some milestones. Uh, and yeah, it took forever. But I as I tried to explain, uh, there were all these reasons for that. So what were the benefits? And was it like even worth it to do this horrible uh, mega thing? Uh, so, uh, we have a pretty good code coverage of the new code. Uh, so, this number is a little confusing, but we can check uh, actually what does it look like right now. And when we focus on the PyAnaconda library, which holds more of the, uh, most of the Python code, you can see that the core package, uh, that's like a general uh, library of functionality, uh, has a pretty good coverage, and the modules have a pretty good coverage, and UI, yes, we don't have tests for UI, so obviously not so well. Uh, and the modules itself, uh, most of them have a very high good code coverage, except for the ones that are really big, like the network module, uh, the storage module, uh, and I forgot the last one, payload. Oh, payload is pretty good. So yeah, I think we did a pretty good job. And when we started, I think the code coverage, we, we didn't even measure code coverage, but I think it was around 20%. And it wasn't great. Uh, so what's next? So the number of end-to-end -end tests that we run daily on Fedora Rawhide with our upstream changes is uh, over a thousand, which is a lot, because when we started, these tests didn't even work properly. So like having these run daily makes me sleep at night. Uh, <laughs> uh, so another like side effect of these things was that we uh, kind of by accident stabilized the GUI and the, like the current user interfaces. Because when you, when you are like modifying the user interface to be able to interact with the Dbus API, um, it means you have to touch the code and you have to test it. And if you find a bug, it doesn't make sense to ignore the bug and leave it there, you fix it. So we were like finding a lot of issues there and fixing like a lot of bugs just by like working with this, uh, with this piece of code. And then we, when we had the bug reports, for example, for RHEL, we, we noticed, okay, but we saw this on, on upstream actually and we fixed it. So it was very easy to just port the fix to, to RHEL and it didn't cost us any additional work. So this was great. Um, another benefit that, uh, of the development of the backend is that it enabled the development of the web UI. Because web UI wouldn't be even possible if it didn't have something to talk to. Uh, so this, this was kind of crucial part of that. And uh, the fact that we can work on this is great. But as I said, this all started years ago. Um, another thing that we improved is the uh, simplified way of customizing Anaconda for products. Uh, as I mentioned, we had some issues with that and we had to handle defaults differently. And side effect of that is that it's very easy to like provide new defaults for your project. And you, do, you don't have to understand Python. It's no longer a weird Python class that's breaking all the time. It's just a simple text file that everyone can understand and change. And you can find it in our repository. Um, another thing that we, this was intentional, uh, was that the support for add-ons is much better uh, on the, on the backend level. And basically there's almost no, no difference between uh, add-on dbus modules and our dbus modules because they use the same basic, uh, like the base API, uh, and we treat them the same. So we uh, were able to like remove some weirdness around it and make sure that uh, it's easier to develop. Uh, also, add-ons can now be developed in other languages if you are lang interested, because it's Dbus and we don't really care what's running behind it. So that's another nice thing. Uh, and one controversial thing I want to mention is that, uh, so since we kind of like dropping the dependency on the Kickstarter data object, the data holder, uh, and using Kickstarter just for input, and it's no longer just there to hold some data, it means that uh, there's a 
possibility to support more formats or maybe switch the format or stuff like that because we don't really depend on packing start so much anymore. Uh, and I personally don't like the current format. <laughs> so uh, if anyone is interested, this is definitely something to think about because I think we could do much better. So what's the future of this? Uh, so right now, uh, my colleague is working on the phase two, uh, which means he's writing uh, debug support for the runtime configuration. Uh, in the future, we want to clean up and stabilize the debug API because it's a little still rough and messy. Still, it was code that was developed for six years, so some of the early parts are not so nice as the later parts. Uh, and also, we have zero documentation of the debug API, which is not great. Um, unfortunately, all the resources are currently working on the web UI, so I cannot promise you when we will have documentation of the Nipas API, but, but we will get there. Um, yeah, so that's all from me. Uh, I just very quickly, because I have time. Uh, so like one, one of the side effects of this was that we created some new libraries. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the Dustbus library for the Dbus communication. Uh, and there's another library called SimpleLine, and that's actually a very simple Python framework for the text-based user interface. Because we don't have only the graphical user interface, we also have the uh, text-based user interface, and because of some weirdness, okay, S390, uh, we couldn't <laughs> use existing uh, libraries. Uh, so uh, this is kind of like um, separated code that used to be for a very long time in Anaconda, and we cleaned it up and created a completely new library that's independent on Anaconda. So you can also use it if you are interested in this. Okay, uh, here are some additional info. As I said, don't look for the Dbus API in our documentation, it's not there. If you have any questions, reach out on metrics. This is the best way how to get any answers. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the question, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question was uh, if we will consider the new uh, format instead of the kickstart, uh, have we considered to use like the existing formats that are used by other installers? Uh, so yeah, this is not really like initiative. This is like I, an idea that I'm like throwing out for someone to, who's interested. Uh, but yeah, it would definitely make sense to, to look at what's there first. Uh, I, I personally would like to be able to use Ansible, but we kind of looked into that and it would be so difficult to support that. Uh, but yeah, it makes sense to like try to unify the formats and, and make it happen. Um, yeah, please. Yeah, okay, so the question was difficult. <laughs> uh, so k k kind of, uh, if, we, if we considered to create uh, the cl client, uh, a, s a simple client that would allow to run the processes first and then um, write the web UI based on this client tool, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, no. <laughs> uh, so basically, like, 
yeah, you kind of have like very limited resources, so you have to like explain everything what you are doing. And there wasn't really like a need for this kind of tool because there are like other tools who are better at just like doing the installation in non-interactive way. Uh, and Anaconda's focus is the interactive uh, installation. So like it's definitely possible to use the backend and write a very simple tool that will just use the backend without any like uh, user interface. Uh, but there was no demand for that, so we didn't really explore this area. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, there was no demand, like no one asked for that. <laughs> so we couldn't just go and like write this piece of code that no one really needed at the point. Um, any other questions? Yeah. So the browsers don't, don't support DBus, so how the application, the JavaScript application, I assume, talks to the DBus interface? Do you use something like the cockpit bridge, or have you uh, created something on your own? Yeah, okay, so the question was about the web UI and how the web UI is actually talking to the DBus services, which is a very good question. And yes, we are using cockpit bridge and basically the whole cockpit set up to, to uh, communicate with the DBus services because the support is already there. It, it was very easy to reuse for this use case. Well, you are using all of it because, yeah, maybe you are not there. So basically, we were like uh, doing this iterative way. So we were like do we were doing the migration over the years uh, iteratively. So there was more and more backend. And since we finished phase two, it means that uh, most of the uh, or all the modules that are related to the system installation are basically finished. So all of that is running via DBus. Uh, the missing parts are just, just very simple edge cases uh, that are related to the runtime configuration and that's currently being worked on. Uh, but otherwise, it's all on DBus and it mostly was DBus for years. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so the question was uh, when we will be able to leave the hybrid solution and uh, fully switch to the DBus modules. And that should be, we should be able to do that at the end of the phase two, which is currently under development, because the phase two is targeting the missing uh, kickstart commands. And once uh, all of these commands are handled by DBus modules, we can like drop all the support in the user interface. And the user interface should use only the data in these DBus modules. And it's also critical for the web UI as well, because it cannot really access any of these data that are not available on the bus. OK, so A, I think this one code covered is pretty OK. But have you ever considered that spending like this, I don't know, a few months of development time to develop it with the, the code covers to 90 plus percent would save you a lot of stress from considering all the scenarios that would break when developing the the yeah, uh, so basically, I guess the question was why the coverage isn't higher. <laughs> uh, uh, and do you mean the unit tests or the end-to-end -end tests? Ah, okay, so the code coverage is related to unit tests, and you really don't want to write unit tests for something that you are going to refactorize like three weeks later. Uh, so we, as, as we did the, um, as we did, a, as we moved a piece of code to the module, we tried to cover it with unit tests. Uh, but since Anaconda is very complicated and it's a lot of code, really, it's really like 100 thousand lines of Python code. It's, it's not so easy to cover all edge cases. Uh, so I would say we did our best and this is what we have, but there's definitely space for improvement and it can be better. Yeah? I, I'm gonna preface my question with a comment. I haven't done this really I, I know. I just wanted to say, I think you've done an amazing job of this. 
I'm the guy who tests this when they're done building it, and it's it's amazing to me how well it's worked the whole way through this kind of slow development process of switching to Viva, so great job on that. And my question is, as you've been going along with the Viva stuff, have you considered dropping support for certain difficult to maintain things, and how have you made that decision? Uh, okay, so the question was if we were uh considering dropping some difficult support uh, and uh, how, how was the process of doing that. Uh, so what we were able to do is that we very often found something that didn't work for years. So we kind of silently dropped it <laughs> because no one was complaining that it doesn't work. <laughs> and, but sometimes there were people who lately, <laughs> later noticed. So we had to like say, okay, it's gone, sorry, we, we are not uh, reviving that. Um, about like specifically targeting difficult parts, I guess it was it never was on the table. I guess we always try to support all the use cases that we had, which maybe we shouldn't because yeah, it was sort of work. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, that was kind of kind of it. We didn't really try to like target some stuff that were already working because we were afraid that someone will complain that okay, but this was to work and now it's not there and you did a horrible. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> Um, another question? Okay, so thank you so much for coming.